my sisters and brothers in Christ, taste and see that the Lord is good. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hello, Oregon. Hello, Andy. Oh, it's good to be home. Last we met, I was just on my way to a magical place called Yale. Uh, if you were to come visit us in New Haven, undoubtedly, undoubtedly, one of the first things you'd learn, as someone described the layout of our campus, is that Marquand Chapel, our community's principal space for worship and prayer, sits on top of the Divinity School Library, thus illustrating our firm belief that knowledge is the foundation of our faith. Well, I'm so glad you got that. <laughs> Hold on to that thought. In the wide, wonderful, messy world of God's holy, universal church, there are voices who say that the Bible is pretty simple. If it says it, it must be so. Perhaps nothing better illustrates the difficulty with those claims than Jesus' straightforward declarative statement, this is my body. <clears throat> simple words, and yet, what does that even mean? Is this just symbolic, or does something actually happen to the bread and the wine? I think most Episcopalians today would affirm what we call the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, though not many feel bold enough to attempt a definition. But everyone wants to know, do the bread and wine actually change? And if so, into what? And how does that work? And also, honestly, isn't that kind of weird? <laughs> At the dramatic heart of today's gospel episode is a really obvious question. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? I don't know about you, but that's a thought that's crossed my mind once or twice. How does this work exactly? Well, let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was a Benedictine monk, an Italian named Anselmo. And in the year 1093, he became the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, Ansel was a smart guy, very well educated. And the monks of his community kind of double-dog dared him to see if he could prove the existence of God by reason alone. No scripture, no doctrine, just straight-up deductive reasoning. Can you make an unassailable case that God exists? And so he wrote a 26-point treatise explaining why God necessarily exists. But at the very beginning of the work, he admits he doesn't quite succeed. You know what he says? He writes, I do not seek to understand that I may believe, but I believe so that I may understand. For I believe this also, that unless I believe, I shall not understand. Is this just a big cop-out? Does this mean faith is merely insisting a set of propositions are true, even though there's no proof? Is all this just in our imaginations? Do you know what cannot exist? Without imagination? Hope. And if I were to come up with a list of synonyms for faith, I'd go with hope before anything else. Imagination is what allows us to see what is wrong in the world because it gives us the ability to picture something better. Imagination is how God shows us what we are to do and who we are to become. In that sense, the imagination is the channel of revelation. Of course God is in our imaginations. This actually was the crux of Anselm's argument. He said, if there's a God, God has to be the single greatest thing you can imagine. And since something that actually exists is greater than something that doesn't exist, if you think God doesn't exist, then what you are thinking of isn't God. 
You can decide for yourselves whether you find that persuasive. <laughs> now, Episcopalians, we, we tend to be okay with doubt. We tend to think that certainty is actually antithetical to faith. And so, in order to have a strong faith, you've got to engage your doubts. Okay. So, why then are the questions raised by Jesus' opponents in today's Gospel presented in such a negative light? Well, it seems to me there are two ways of being doubtful. One is with curiosity and wonder. And the other is with cynicism. These guys are the opposite of St. Anselm. Their challenge to Jesus is, prove it and we'll believe. I'll compare them with Mary. When the angel said to her that she was going to be with child, she said, how can this be? This is an expression of doubt, right? How can this be? But she wasn't cynical. These guys, they're not curious. They're scoffing. And because of their arrogance, they cannot see who it is that is right in front of them. You know, I, I could give you a historical survey of theological claims about what's going on in the Eucharist to try to convince you of something. But I feel like if you're convinced, you're done thinking about it. And we're not ever supposed to stop thinking about what is happening for us on the altar. I would rather give you something to stimulate your imaginations than to settle your doubts. So here's a piece of wisdom. This is from Rumi, the great Sufi mystic of the 1200s. Yes, a Muslim. Rumi says, your daily bread is more in love with you than you are with it. Ponder that when you come to the rail today. All right, let, let's go back to the Divinity School Library. Anselm got it. He said of his efforts, we do this not with a view to arriving at faith through reason, but in order that we may take delight in the understanding and contemplation of the things we believe. In other words, it's supposed to be fun. Or as my medieval theology professor put it, the reason theology matters is because there is more to life than theology. It is a pleasure to read and study, and it strengthens my faith, but not in the sense of convincing me. It's more like when I read good theology, it gives shape and structure and vocabulary to the mystery of God I already conceive intuitively. But you've got to approach it with that sense of wonder. Don't look to be convinced by it. Look to fall in love. And don't let this be an exclusively cerebral endeavor. The divine presence can be experienced by all our senses and faculties. There is a reason the Lord is present to us in the basic life-sustaining elements of food and drink. The sacrament on the altar demands of us, can you see what is right in front of you? You can, in fact, taste and see that the Lord is good. There is another historic meaning of the phrase, the body of Christ. It's us. You, me, and all of us. It's the church. You ask, do the bread and wine actually become flesh and blood? Well, literally, yes. They become our bodies, which were formed for love and made for service. Now, this uh, funny little display case in which we place the bread, the, the monstrance, I know, it sounds like monster, but the closest English cognate is demonstrate. I don't know if you're having conversations with people who don't want to go to church. I try to. 
I feel like most of the talk within the church about how to get people to come is primarily cosmetic. We're worried, ah, we're singing music that's too old, or we're using too many fancy words. Uh, these things don't come up when I talk with people about why they don't want to come. You know, it used to be missionary work. You went and told people about Jesus. Well, people know about Jesus. They like Jesus. It's the church that disappoints them. The healing, the forgiving, the feeding, hanging out and having dinner with imperfect people, they like all that. But they look over at the church and, well, that is not what they are seeing and hearing. People aren't sitting around waiting for an invitation. They know where we are. They know what time we meet, but they don't want to come because they don't expect to find Jesus here. In the Eucharist, we believe that Jesus is really, truly, physically and metaphysically here. Later on in John's Gospel, some Greeks will approach the Apostles Andrew and Philip and say, we wish to see Jesus. And not just because it's on their bucket list, met Jesus Christ, check. <laughs> but because they hoped for, they imagined an encounter that would change their lives. In faith, when we adore the sacrament in the monstrance on the altar, we believe we can see Jesus. We can see the resurrected body of Christ. But Jesus didn't come to be gazed at. He was seen doing things. He was demonstrating for us who and how to be. On this feast of Corpus Christi, then, let us renew our commitment to being the visible body of Christ in the world. Amen. Amen. Amen.